the difference between being the quickest and the fastest driver and being maybe the 10th fastest driver was 0.2 of a second on a two minute lap. That's crazy. Here's to all of you who have picked yourself up after failure, who put your heart and soul into hard work. You judge results by your own standards. The grind is where you find your edge and through it all, finding success, especially success in the form of gold. WIS gets you and exists to help fellow go-getters just like you. WIS helps businesses win by outworking and adding more value than their competition in the tech and accounting space. That's the edge. WIS is good with numbers, epic with people. Welcome to the Just Women Sports Podcast, where we talk to the biggest athletes in the world about the untold stories behind their success. I'm Kelly O'Hara, and my guest today is Jamie Chadwick. Jamie started her motorsports career in kart racing at 11 years old. She was the youngest and first female driver to win a British GT championship and then became the first female winner of a BRDC British Formula 3 race and the MR Challenge Championship. Two race victories and three other podium finishes saw Jamie crown the inaugural W Series champion in 2019 when she was also named as a development driver for the Williams F1 team. Jamie defended her title in 2021, winning the W Series again after the tour skipped over 2020. At just 23 years old, Jamie is already at the top of her sport and she's still just getting started. Jamie, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. How you doing? I'm good. I'm good. I like that intro. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. It's awesome uh, being able to read all the athletes, a a condensed version of all of their success, which you've had so much. You're still super young. I have to be completely honest. I am an absolute novice when it comes to racing, driving, all the things, but I find it fascinating. I'm so excited to talk to you today. I'm probably going to come off as a total noob and like, you're going to have to explain some things to me, but I'm really excited to talk to you. So thank you for coming on. That's right. And honestly, don't worry, because I feel like most people don't understand our sport. So uh, you are definitely one of the majority. Um, It's super complicated and hard to explain as well. So do not feel bad at all. Ask me all the questions you need to ask. Awesome. Yeah. I feel like there's so many different like categories and levels and I and... think this and I'm sure they don't help themselves the sport could do better at making it a bit more obvious I'm sure got it that makes sense well we're gonna start from the beginning before we get into you giving me all of the details of exactly how your sport works what was childhood like for you you grew up in Bath England um or you're born in Bath England but you grew up on the Isle of Man so what what did childhood look like for little Jamie um little jamie was yeah just flat out playing sport to be honest um yeah, yeah I was, where i grew up um for those that don't know bath is quite sort of you know countryside sort of place there's a lot of sort of room for activities to not try and quote step others um there's a lot of things that you can you know explore different sports different um opportunities and yeah i grew up early in my life there but then quite quickly moved to a place called the isle of man which for those that don't know is kind of It's a small little island, very, very small, but has uh, a lot of motorsport events at there. So there's something called the TT, which is a famous motorbike race. And there's a lot of rallying that goes on there and there's a kart circuit. So I'm not sure if that's got anything to do with it, but at that point I still had no involvement in racing. I just, you know, grew up there, um, just watched all these kind of events. And then I came back to the UK when I was about, I think six or seven years old. And yeah, kind of, continued on my sort of journey I wanted to be a skier I think when I was about 10 years old and then at 12 years old I wanted to be a hockey player at 14 years old I think I probably wanted to be a tennis player I kind of just went through the the phases and I think at 12 years old was the first time I drove the goat cup fascinating okay so what about the Isle of Man made it is is why why is it a racing destination like why are there so many races there I don't know to be honest I think it's from a, I guess they do the TT, which is a bike race where they go on the roads around the island and they okay. basically do a whole lap of the island because it's, it's that small. And yeah, honestly, it's crazy. If you watch the bike race itself, it's mental something that I think my parents would never have let me <laughs> never let me do. But I think from a really young age, I kind of had that association with speed and I followed 
the race and I watched it and I think it became natural for me to see that kind of adrenaline and that speed and that nature even though I'd never you know driven a car or driven a go-kart or been on a motorbike or anything like that um, and they have rallying there as well it's all in the countryside so there's quite a lot of off-road rally races that, that they host as well so I think weirdly at some point in my brain and my sort of childhood and youth growing up I kind of something clicks with the adrenaline of the sport and I clearly kind of develop some sort of love for it without necessarily really realizing that makes sense I feel like I never saw a race growing like the first race I went to was Daytona 500 a couple years ago you know so I had never seen so that's I think that's why I don't know of it any of it but the fact that you grew up in a destination for racing must have had like you said a little bit to do with it Exactly. And to be honest, I think over in Europe and especially in the UK, there's a lot more around mode sport than maybe in America. I mean, Daytona 500 and the Indy 500 are massive, massive events, but there's so many other sporting events that you have, whereas mode sport's a bit more, um, yeah, a bit more common over here. So it seemed a little bit easier maybe to follow it and get into it. Um, yeah, obviously growing up on the Isle of Man and then also, yeah, being back even when I was in England, get involved in the sport, the access yeah. to it was actually a bit easier. Yeah, that makes sense for sure. But like you said, you first were into, I guess you can call them more like regular sports, mainstream sports, sports I've done before. You're into skiing, hockey, tennis. So how did you get into your first race of of driving as opposed to like skiing? To be honest, I still don't know the exact answer. My parents always make it up, but a lot of it was to do with my brother. Um, okay. So my brother is a couple of years older and we were so, well, still are, but so competitive growing up. And whatever sport we did, I had this kind of weird thing, whereas I would never see it possible for him to be better than me at anything and vice versa. So I love we'd play that. football growing up, we'd play tennis, anything. It was always the case. And he, I, th- I think he went to like a friend's birthday party um, when he was about 13 or 14 and they went go-karting. And he kind of developed this sort of interest in this sport and he started following Formula One and following the sport. And I still had no idea about it at all. And I wasn't that bothered until he started getting or started taking it much more seriously. And at that stage, I was like, actually, I want to have a go at this and I want to see if I can um, do this as well. And I think it must have been just purely sibling rivalry but <laughs> that spurred my interest to give it a go for the first time. And yeah, when I had my first go and we started go-karts and then progress, progress into cars, I had no idea about the sport, didn't really have much interest prior to it. I kind of watched a bit of Formula One, but not not much at all. And honestly, it's one of those moments that I just really was like, this is so cool. I want to I want to be involved in this sport now. That's hilarious that your brother started doing it and you're like, no. And when he got a little good or he started getting serious about it, you wanted to do it, too. Like you had to try it out. Exactly. I was like, I think back at it and at the time I'm sure I just thought you know let's give it a go but now I think back at it it's definitely to do with yeah just trying to beat my older brother which I'm sure Um, he hated at the time that's amazing going back to doing I guess I keep saying more regular sports more mainstream sports of those what was your favorite you said skiing hockey tennis all of those by the way I'm not good at hockey but love skiing love tennis so what what sport would you say was your favorite to be honest, and this is a really bad answer, but the sport I would have been best at at the time would have been my favourite. So I was quite good at hockey. So that was my favourite sport. But I don't think it actually was my favourite sport in terms of to do or anything like that. It's just because it was the sport I was best at. And <laughs> any sport that I was bad at, I wouldn't do. I'd hate it. Um, don't know why, but I just felt like, yeah, I would try it. And I'd be like, so netball, for example, in the UK is a, is a big sport. And tried it wasn't very good at it I was too short and just gave up straight away (laughs) so yeah I'd say probably hockey um but I love skiing and unfortunately I think if I wanted to pursue skiing I would have had to have moved over to Europe and yeah really committed to that and I didn't really want to do that at that stage but I did love skiing a lot yeah that makes sense so you said you started in kart racing and you were around 11 so can you explain even what that means like what does that look like you're 11 years old you're driving something for a competition you can't even drive on the street yet like what does that as an 11 year old look like yeah I mean so 11 is actually relatively late to get involved as 11 or 12 and it's relatively late to get involved in 
even go-karting and yeah effectively what go-karting is is it's really small little um yeah carts with an engine and it's actually quite mind-blowing to think that you would put an eight-year-old in these carts they go up to sort of 60 70 miles an hour which when you're sort of that far off the ground you're a few inches off the ground is um yeah feels really fast the tires are very small and yeah we would go around well the sort of karting circuit you know it goes up to world championship level it's a much bigger world than I even ever realized but when I started at sort of 11 or 12 years old it was I would call it arrive and drive so I didn't have my own go-kart or anything like that I would turn up to the track the team will have or this uh yeah the team and the circuit will have the cart available and I will go and I would drive it around and I'll do some races and practice sessions and what have you and it would be maximum once a month for maybe six months of the year so I'll go six times a year and I just really enjoyed it and it was a hobby on a Sunday afternoon my dad would take us my brother would be there as well and then from there it kind of progressed into okay what's the next step and because my parents never you know raced or came from a racing background we kind of made it up a little bit we didn't really know what the obvious step would be it wasn't like they knew exactly how to take us through the sport. So the next step for me was, okay, if we get our own go-kart, then we can take that wherever we want to, any track we want to, and we can do it ourselves. So that was the next step. And fortunately, my brother was kind of always a few months or a year ahead of me. So he would kind of take the next step and then I could kind of follow him through it. And so, yeah, we got our own go-kart when I was about 12 or 13 and then started racing around the country again only really once a month like really just as a hobby and then it progressed into something a little bit more and it was a few times a month and then after that I was like okay what's the next step and it ended up being car racing so it really was just something that grew into something that I didn't realize was ever a a possibility really. So would you say that early on even in the beginning stages when it felt like a hobby or it was a hobby it was a Sunday afternoon for you and your dad and your brother were you good at it? Like, were you instantly like, oh, I could be pretty good at this? I think yes, to a degree, because because I played other sports, I kind of had that feeling of competitiveness. And I kind of it's like I think I'm a big believer of athletes and sports people can generally transfer their skills into anything. Obviously, there's, you know, finite skills that are required in any sport, but generally the big skill that's required and the ability to learn and translate that into other sports I think is you know transferable skills wise across the board so I obviously like I said played other sports and then I went into karting and it felt quite natural to do the things they were telling me to do and I was able to pick it up reasonably quickly in that sense and I really like the fact in in karting unlike maybe hockey which is obviously you know a bigger sport with more members of the team it's hard to get direct feedback. So I missed a shot. Like I wouldn't necessarily know why I missed the shot. Whereas in karting, I had, you know, video to show me and loads of different bits of feedback that could show me there and then why I made a mistake. So I love the fact that I could quickly learn and I could quickly make big, big steps to get better. And I think that was a big part of why I enjoyed it so much initially. And then as soon as you kind of combined, yeah, the thrill and the speed and the adrenaline of being in a go-kart that goes 60 miles an hour, with the fact that you're being competitive and trying to beat other people and ultimately win and have, you know, uh, good success in it. I think the whole combination was something I just fell in love with. Makes sense. I can't believe that the carts go 60 miles per hour. Like yeah. to me, that's that's crazy. That a kid could be in that and be going that fast and it be legal. <laughs> I know. And weirdly, I went car because karting is actually quite good training to do in the winter when when we can't be in the cars all the time. And um, yeah, I went back and I was seeing these eight year olds. They would come from school or whatever, wherever they've been, and they'll drive in the evenings and they're driving these carts. And I can't believe how good they are and how they're doing it, because honestly, they weigh like 30 kilos, 25, 30 kilos, and they're just there killing it so it's crazy I'm not sure if I'd ever put my own children in a go-kart but yeah fortunately my parents were, were happy to put my brother and I into it and yeah we we're able to pursue it crazy as an athlete and a footballer data has helped me elevate my game whether it's tracking my GPS during a game or training 
monitoring my heart rate during workouts, recording my top speed throughout speed sessions, and even making sure I am properly recovering. Data has allowed me to customize my training and ultimately get me to the next level. It has truly been a defining factor in my approach to my training and my performance. Our good friends at WIS also love data. They provide services that blend tech and accounting to help businesses get the data they need to track performance. WIS is the coach that comes alongside you, reviews your financials, and identifies the technology you need to get the business results you want. WIS is good with numbers, epic with people. You talked about hockey already. I read that you turned down a trial with England's U18 hockey team to compete in the Ganetta, right? Ganetta? Uh, Janetta. Janetta. That's it, yeah. Janetta Junior Scholarship Weekend. So England U18, like national team, hockey team, turned out an invite to compete in this scholarship weekend. So can you, one, explain what that weekend was and then kind of talk about that decision? Because it seems like a very big decision because that seems like a fantastic opportunity for a sport that you knew that you were pretty good at. Yeah, I mean, weirdly back, well, when it happened, it didn't seem like such a big decision. And now in retrospect, it seems maybe bigger bigger than it was. But yeah, I think... Obviously, I played different sports and I didn't want to specialise in a sport at such a young age. So most of, like I said, when these kids or guys and girls start when they're eight years old, they specialise in motorsport straight away. And that is their sport and they fully commit to it. Whereas I never did that. I, like I said, started when I was 11 or 12 and kind of was quite happy to go karting once a month and play hockey on the other weekends. And I remember I went to a school that... Um, I was on a scholarship for hockey at that school and the deal was that we'd play matches on a Saturday. I would go practice in the go-karts in the morning and then I'd come back for the matches in hockey in the afternoon. And I loved kind of having that balance. I liked not having to specialise necessarily in one sport. And then obviously the scholarship that with Janetta, that was um, the opportunity that, for those that don't know, to progress in car racing. Um, it costs a lot of money anyway to to be involved in motorsport and Janetta, which is a small manufacturer, car manufacturer in the UK, um, do a scholarship where when you're 14 years old, if you win the scholarship, you get a fully funded season in their championship, which is a junior car racing series. So it's a huge opportunity and one that I had always looked at, but never necessarily thought it was something I would be able to get involved in. And the dates happened to clash with the date of uh, an England hockey trial. I was playing hockey, so they divide it into regions. So the southwest of England I was playing for. And the next step, it's called, I can't remember what it's called, high pack or something. You progress into these matches that are trials for, for the national team. And at the time, I wasn't that bothered by it. I just was quite thinking, you know, the scholarship seems like a no brainer. So I quite quickly just said, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to do the scholarship. And like I said, in retrospect, it's clearly quite a big decision, but back then it, it didn't seem like that. And I think that's a good thing because clearly there's a reason why I, I picked motorsport. Yeah, for sure. It it was probably like the decisive moment that took you on that path to become who you've become in this sport. Exactly. And to be honest at the time, not that I'm sure this was a big factor, but hockey in the UK, it wasn't even a professional sport for women, which now they've won well Olympic gold in Rio and they won bronze um, in the last in Tokyo. It seems crazy, but it wasn't a professional sport. So actually from a, you know, sort of young girl looking at what sporting opportunities I could be involved in in the long term, hockey is just something I did for fun. I didn't actually think that that would be a career, whereas fortunately motorsport seemed to offer, you know, what felt like greater opportunities. That makes sense. Can you... Tell me, so you did a little bit about the Janetta um, championship season and this scholarship. So basically you had to, how could you just, can you just enter Like, did you have to win a certain number of races to be eligible to try out for this scholarship? And it sounds like it's a pretty intense type of thing to win and you got to beat out a bunch of other racers. So what was that like? Yeah, you send in an application, I think, so long ago, I can't remember. You send an application and it gets narrowed down and you get invited along. And there were 60 people that got invited to the shootout days. So there's three days that the assessments go on for. And yeah, it was I was the only girl. There were 60 of us. Um, and the assessments over the three days consist of, so on-track driving. So you drive 
the racing car, fitness and media um, skills. So yeah, it was intense also because I was so young. I was, I think, yeah, 13, 14 at the time. And also didn't know much about motorsport, didn't really know much about what was going on. It was quite overwhelming, but yeah, fortunately managed to to win that after yeah, the three days. And that gave me my first real big leg up in the championship or in, in motorsport. That's crazy. So you beat out all the other, other racers. You're the only female attempting to win the scholarship. You win it and it affords you the opportunity to compete in this junior championship season. So, and you said you're only 14 at the time. Yeah, that's right. Again, can't legally drive, but now <laughs> you're... Did, did this make you a professional driver or is that as a junior championship, you're not considered professional yet? I think, well, by definition of professional, I guess you're paying, uh, you're being paid to to do what you're doing. And I wasn't being paid, paid to do it. I had, um, yeah, obviously won the scholarship, which fully funded the season. And yeah, I guess I had a few sponsors on board, but I wasn't, wasn't being paid, paid to race at that point. But to be in that position in that age and not be, you know, having to bring money to, you know, compete actually is, is very rare. So it felt like a massive opportunity at that point. Yeah. So what did like the day in day out look like for you? Because at this point, are you still going to school? How, how intense is this tour? Yeah. So I was still at school at this point and um, yeah, well, I was only, yeah, the first two years I did, so I was 14. So still at school, still studying. I would have been doing, I don't know what exams we have over in the UK, but there was no option to drop out of school at that age. It was, yeah, you had to do yeah. school. And I went to a school that had Saturday school as well. And we would race on, or we'd practice on Friday, qualify on Saturday and race on Sunday. So I had to take out a lot of time. Um, I was fortunate the school seemed to, I'm not sure if they were okay with it, but they let me do it. Oh, I ended up doing it. And yeah, it was, it was intense, but I loved it. I was so happy that I could yeah, I love, I enjoyed school. I could go to school during the week and then go racing on the weekends. And it was, although it was a huge opportunity and it, I did take it very seriously. It still felt like something that I was doing as maybe a hobby because it was so, yeah, the way I, now I look back at it and comparison to what I have to do now, you know, I was able just to bounce between, yeah, school, go, yeah, study geography in the morning and then be in a race car in the afternoon. And it just seemed normal. So wild. I mean, I guess it's kind of like playing any any other sport in high school. It just seems like there's this heightened sense to it because it's you you do have sponsors, you know, it's racing. It just seems a bit more intense than like playing hockey after school. Yeah, definitely. And yeah, like the little things of, you know, the races were covered on TV and, you know, you had sponsors and like you said, there was this whole kind of yeah extra yeah, I guess hype around around it although when I was at school I never really spoke about the fact I was going away and racing in my head it felt like some cool different thing that I was able to do um and yeah I loved it for that reason well in 2014 so you started in 2013 on the Janetta junior championship season in 2014 you took five podium finishes and finished eighth overall and that's in a field of how many? Uh, it would have been about 25, I think. Okay, Not so you're sure. you're pretty high up there. You're still, what is, what's the, what's the age range in that series? Uh, so that's 14 to 17. Okay, so. so junior, junior. Yeah, so you're on the younger end of that age range. You finish eighth. Is this when you started to see, oh, I could become a professional, like this is what I wanna do? Um, to be honest, still no. <laughs> um, really? I, I'm sure I'm sure if you read interviews from me at the time, I say yes. But okay. I think in terms of genuine belief, no. I think I really enjoyed it. I was happy to be in that position. But I, I don't think I genuinely thought I would make a career out of it. I think, you know, so many young guys, especially because I was still the only girl that was racing, that were coming in and they started when they were, yeah, like I said, eight years old and the level that I felt like they were at was so much higher than the level that I was at, given the fact I'd only just started even watching Formula One. That yeah, it, it really did feel like a hobby at the time. And I, I think I was maybe 16, when 16 or 17, when I really thought, actually, no, this is what I want to do professionally. 
Okay, or is so it I could do professionally. Okay, so is that when you moved up to the senior categories and you signed on to race an Aston Martin Racing V8 Vantage GT4 with yeah. Beachstein Motorsport? Yeah, that's right. So that was kind of so a step up to the British Championship. And okay. In so in motorsport, we have kind of two sort of or two um, disciplines basically. Okay. You've got if to compare it to maybe like running, you've got endurance racing and you've got what we call sort of single seaters. So that's the equivalent to you know long distance running and sprinting. So the sprint racing is um, the single seaters. So that's like your Formula One, Formula Two, Formula Three, and Formula Four. Like the you know, broad terms, the single seater racing and the endurance racing is what we call GT racing or sports cars. And that's okay. long duration. Um, and it's, they're very different disciplines. And after the Janetta stuff, I chose to go into the endurance racing instead of going into the more kind of, I guess, prescribed route of going into single seaters. And I went endurance racing with Aston Martin in a yeah, Vantage sports car in the British championship. Okay, so in the Janetta Junior Championship season, you're you're driving a cart, like the small, your single seater. Uh, no, I'm mean, still in a car, uh, okay. but it's a small car. It's designed for, you know, junior drivers to to drive. It's very low power. But then after that, you go either into yeah something like sports cars, which is more like a race car version of what you'd see on the road. So you'll see a Ferrari on the road, you'll see a McLaren, a Aston Martin, and they're the race car version of that. Um, and they do endurance races. So races from between yeah, two to 24 hour races, whereas the single seater stuff are like the formula cars. So they look like the formula one cars, the Indy cars, the yeah, sort of really refined race cars that you see. It seems like that's a pretty big jump, right? So it's, you, you move up to the senior category. So what made you decide to do that? How did you do that? Do you have to qualify? Like how did that, what, what did that look like? Yeah, so I was, I was, I always talk about my career because I was so lucky with the people that were around me at the right times. And at the time when I was in the junior championship, I was being coached by a driver that was, uh, you know, Aston Martin driver. He raced for Aston Martin um, and his name is Johnny Adam and he coached me in, in juniors. And he was the one that was like, I think there's an opportunity for you if you if you go into into this and to the British Championship and I will give you a good reference and I'll support you and yeah, we'll get you a test in the car. So I tested the car, I practiced in the car and was yeah, did a good job. And from there it kind of meant that I was able to become part of the Aston Martin Junior Academy that they had, uh, which was about supporting own drivers and yeah, that's kind of how they got the opportunity to then compete in in that championship. So in 2015, you're with your teammate Ross Gunn, and you went on to secure the British GT Championship GT4 title in your first year. Yeah, yeah. To me, that's like that's mind blowing. You're you're 16 or 17 at this point. Uh, we won it when I was 16, and then I turned 17 just after. So you're the youngest driver and the first female to win a British GT Championship. Yeah. <laughs> you're like yeah. <laughs> That's to me, that's incredible. And did you, I mean, at this point, you're like, okay, I'm really good at this. I can be very successful. I do you feel pressure? Like, what is going, or is it still just a fun thing that you're doing? Definitely still a fun thing I was doing. But I then started to think, actually, this could be something I want to do full time. Because also, when you're aligned with like a manufacturer like Aston Martin and you've got a team like that, that, uh, supporting you um it definitely became a lot more serious and it was yeah the, you know that was my first british championship that i'd won and the kind of um yeah the feeling around that definitely felt like i said a lot more yeah professional and yeah i guess much bigger of a deal than than anything i'd done before so i, I noticed kind of everything suddenly went from maybe where I was currently at, thinking it was a fun hobby to being a lot more serious after that. This season, we've highlighted countless women, both in sport and in business, who have pushed the boundaries of their fields, honed their craft, and blazed the trail for the next generation. From the stories we tell to the athletes and brands involved, we are always looking to elevate the game. 
So when the Just Women's Sports podcast was looking for a partner for the season, we wanted to find a company that shared our vision of showcasing individual feats and telling personal stories of triumph and overcoming obstacles. Because of that, partnering with WIS Financial was a no-brainer. With the forward-thinking team that's dedicated to changing the game, we've been able to share the stories of so many inspiring women. WIS, it is companies like you who continue to change the game. And to those listening, it is our audience who continues to inspire us to build for better. Thank you so much for your support this season. What do you think is the reason behind your success at such a young age? Um, I think ignorance. <laughs> I mean, <just laughs> that is, that's, a good, that's a good thing. I mean, that's a good point. It, it does happen sometimes honestly, that way. Honestly, just I'm, I think I was so naive and in a really good way. Um, but I just was so happy to be doing what I was doing. And yeah, I just, I focused on, I didn't feel the pressure so much because I didn't really see it being such a big, big thing. And yeah, I think from a the big thing also to get involved in the sport as a woman, it's a bit unusual and there are so few women and it's so male dominated. I think I just had no perception for that. I had no knowledge of the fact that I was one of so few females. I was mm. no sort of, well, I didn't notice that at all. And I kind of just got in and did the job. And even I look at myself now, now I'm 23 and I look at myself back when I was 16, I was like, Christ, I had so much confidence back then. I don't know where where that came from. And I think if I yeah, was trying to get involved in the sport now, I definitely wouldn't be that kind of naive to it. And I'm sure it was probably a good thing back then. Absolutely. And it is funny how that works sometimes. You just, you're young young and dumb and you're just like yeah this is fun i enjoy it i'm good at it i don't feel the pressure i don't know the pressure and it's pretty incredible the things that you can achieve however as you have been successful you've continued to be successful so i will say that i don't think your success is just from being naive and being young but you can say that for you know for what you were doing back then (laughs) um I'm just curious. Still naive, maybe. So yeah, yeah, maybe, maybe. What does the team look like that's surrounding you at this point in your career? Because you talk about because in in that's what I find so interesting in racing or in driving is that you have the drivers, driver or drivers, and then but then the team, like the pit crew, everything that goes into it, it just seems so involved, so intricate, so detail oriented. What can you explain what that looks like? Yeah, it's a massive team sport. Um, that's the bit I think people maybe don't realize from the outside I think the driver gets most of the kind of um yeah celebration and they're the one that yeah gets the the headlights or headlines but it's yeah such a team sport and you've got well I've got so like a smaller team that are just around me regardless of what you know racing team I end up racing for like I guess in in football um you'll have a smaller team that just support you regardless of whether you play for Chelsea or Liverpool or whatever team you play for um and then I've got so yeah my management um and my trainer and you know the people that work closely with me um and I put family and friends within that team as well to be honest um and then there's the bigger team that are the race team that you're with. So say, for example, I'm racing with, you know, a team like um, I think in Formula One, you have, say, Williams. Then you've got your engineer. You've got well, a lot more than one engineer. You've got all your engineers. Then you've got your mechanics that work on the car and make sure that the car is yeah doing the job that the car needs to do. And then you've got your team principal. And Honestly, it adds up. If you look at Mercedes Formula One team, so the team that Lewis Hamilton's currently with, there's 1,500 people uh, in that team, and it's 1,500 people to make two cars go racing, which is oh incredible when you actually gosh. think about it. That's wild. I it's did not okay. expect that number. Wow. But it's amazing. It's an amazing thing because you just see how the sport operates, and everyone has their job. And without everyone doing their job to the best ability, then they won't win races and I won't win a race if my mechanic, you know, doesn't do the job he needs to do or my engineer doesn't, you know, give me the best setup advice or whatever it is. And I love that because everyone has to do their job and there's so many variables so that when you get the result and you get success, the feeling is, in my opinion, like no other, because you know so much has gone into that. Are you, as a driver, very interested in 
the mechanical side of the car, how it functions, that sort of thing, the engineering? I think you have to be, yeah, because you're driving it. The car is, the way you drive the car, you need it to, it's a bit cliche, but you need to be at one with the car. It's kind of like, I guess, in skiing, um, you need to feel everything through your feet and maybe horse riding as well. You need to have such a good amount of feel for what the car's doing to drive it fully on the limit that you kind of need to understand mechanically what's going on. And we make so many changes to the car because the margins are so, so small. You're constantly trying to find the smallest margins. So yeah, every little detail makes a big difference. And I think if you're not aware of the you know requirements of, yeah, or the engineering side of it and the mechanical side of it, then it just makes it that bit more difficult, I think. Yeah, I I think that I would be really into that sort of thing. I my brain works like in an engineering way and learning everything that goes into making a car successful and a championship car sounds really interesting and really cool. Exactly. I think as a sports person, I mean, you would have been the same. You look for every little bit of advantage you can get or every bit of performance and you look whether that's, you know, in yourself and your training and your nutrition or whatever it is or, you know, in the car which you think with the car there's so many things it's just natural that you just try and pick up or pick apart everything that you can yeah what okay at this point what does your training look like for your 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 racing double seater is that what you call it double seater uh, single seaters oh so sorry back uh in yeah GT back then cars. Oh, yes. back in GT cars. Um, so what yeah what is that what does your training look like um so still at this point i was still at school so i was still mm. trying to sort of tie and everything and at that point so the races were kind of long races and I think I don't know if it's different now if it's just harder now but back then my body seemed to just adapt to things a lot quicker (laughs) because I didn't feel like I needed to train nearly as much as I have to train now when I was younger but a lot of it was because they're endurance races it was a lot more cardio um and yeah dealing with the heat so the car gets to sort of like you're gonna have to translate this to Fahrenheit because I don't know how hot that is but sort of 40 to 50 degrees temperature in the cockpit and you're oh, in wow. temperature with a full helmet with full overalls on for that's two, very three very hours. hot so it's yeah it's Dang. that's the bit that was the hardest hardest thing to get used to but yeah like I said it was I think my body just adapted much quicker maybe when I was younger because um now I feel like I have to train a lot, a lot harder than I did back then. Makes sense. So in 2017, you switch over to single seaters. What went into that decision of, okay, I'm done doing the GT series. Did I say that right? Yeah, yeah, that's right. And then now you're going to do British Formula 3 championship. Just opportunity, to be honest. Um, okay. I think, so single seaters is, the route most people take initially and generally speaking it's more expensive but when you're in single seaters you're the only driver you don't have a teammate that you're racing with the races are shorter and the ultimate goal is formula one so the pinnacle of the sport is the ultimate goal and if you go into just gt racing and you don't do any single seaters you can't then go into formula one so when i committed to doing the racing in sports cars and gt racing i closed the door to formula one because i didn't do the single seater route again to try and liken it to maybe running it's com- it's like committing fully to long distance running and deciding no i'm not going to ever be a sprinter even though the 100 meter sprint is maybe the pinnacle like, i'm never going to do that i'm only going to be a long distance runner so i was happily doing that but i was always asked the question of do I want to be the first woman in Formula One since this age? And the results I was getting in the GT side kind of showcased that there could be the opportunity to do that if I did jump across and go into single seaters. So these doors started opening and this conversation started. And from my side, it was a bit of a difficult jump to or transition to make because yeah, it suddenly puts me in a position where um, I'd had success in the GT world and I was going to go into a whole world where I'd never even experienced and could have no success and it could be career over. But I just thought I want to now, at this point, I wanted a career in the sport and I wanted to be a racing driver and I wanted to ultimately be in Formula One. So yeah, these opportunities came around in in British Formula Three. So I, I kind of jumped at the chance. How do you make that jump? Do you sign up for a race like do you enter on you know like how does yeah you, be, you, you join a team how does that work yeah it's 
so confusing on the face of it but yeah you I'm sorry <laughs> no no you're so you're so right I am um, I find it it's a sport that even because I've been in that position where I didn't really understand it um and obviously now I've been through it I understand it but at the time like in GTs I was like okay so how do I if I want to make Formula One happen how do I do this and yeah. that's where the right people advising me did definitely help but um yeah I joined a team um, in Formula 3. I remember talking to a few teams and I didn't really know what was a good team, what was a bad team, how how it all worked. But I joined a British team. Obviously, it's British Formula 3, but a lot of, you know, foreign drivers and drivers from all over the world come into into this series. So I joined a British team and um, just went from there, really. Completely, yeah, thrown in at the deep end. Had my first test after I had signed to do the series with the team. Um, and yeah, it was a challenge, but I liked the challenge. It was very different to what I'd been used to, but I liked the challenge. I liked the training that was required to get to speed with it. And it felt a little bit more rewarding uh, when I got a result because of that. What was the biggest change that you had to make personally to be able to compete in that type of racing? It, for me, felt like the margins were much, much smaller. So in the GT racing, um, like I said, the races were a lot longer, a lot more things could go right or wrong. And because the races were longer, the margins felt a bit bigger in terms of ultimate performance. You know, you could win a race by 10 seconds or you could be on pole by a second or qualify best by a big margin. Whereas in the single seaters and the F3 stuff, the margins were tiny. So yeah, the difference between being the quickest and the fastest driver and being maybe the 10th fastest driver was 0.0 two of a second on a two minute lap. That's crazy. And so the margins to me were so small that I felt like I had to go to such a higher level to get the best out of myself. And I had never done that in any sport and in anything in, in my career, I'd never had to do that. So that was the big thing, teaching myself to be able to, yeah, push myself a little bit more to find find that tiny bit. Did you hire a new trainer? Like, what was it the physical aspect that you put the most effort into? I mean, I assume it was probably all of it, but um, I just, it, it, there's such different races. Yeah, exactly. Actually, you're bang on. The physical thing was the thing I found the hardest. That was because it was, a, it's a much more physical, single seaters is much more physical for me, I find personally, than the GT racing. Um, and so I obviously jumped in and, thought, okay, this could be good. And straight away I was like, okay, this is hard. And yeah. the physical side of it was the big thing. Uh, I did get a new trainer or started working with, I didn't work with a trainer before. Um, so I started working with a trainer, started working with a nutritionist, started actually, you know, really trying to find every little bit of performance that I could. So you, you jump into it, you make the switch. And in 2018, you become the first woman to ever win a British F3 race by winning at Brands Hatch. What yeah. what did that win mean to you? Because it seems pretty monumental and like a good uh, just validation that you're you're in the right sport, you're doing the right thing, like you you just won and you're the first female to do it. Yeah, it's funny. I think it's weird from my side because I didn't realize that I was the first female to do it until afterwards. Nice. So, yeah again but in the significance of that wasn't relevant for me but in the bigger picture and the media and everything it was the only thing that was people talked, talked about. about yeah um, which was surprising to me because i never really thought of it like that and from my side that was the second to last race weekend that um we had 10 weekends or 10 races in the year um three races a weekend so 30 races a year and that would have been the yeah 25th race maybe 26th race of 30. so the 25 races before that i had already felt like i was in a position to win a race and i'd gone through each one and be like oh, i still not won a race yet i've got podiums i just hadn't got to the point where i'd won a race so when it happened it just felt like a long time coming i was just like thank god I finally <laughs> finally done that that weights off my shoulders and yeah just the reaction afterwards was just surprising because i never thought of it like anything else i just thought i should have won a race ages ago <laughs> and that's yeah that's the way i felt that's amazing okay so in 2019 this is when you're when you're racing in um you did f3 and then yeah. in 2019 w series debuted so 
This is the inaugural series or inaugural season of the W series in March, 2019. Can you explain what the W series is? Yeah, so this will take a little bit more because it sounds confusing, but okay. W series basically um, came about because even like I said, I was the first female to win a British F3 race. And although on the face of it, that's great for me, I shouldn't have been the first female to win a British F3 race. In my opinion, it's a problem with the sport because there are too few females racing in the sport for the fact that I was the first one to do that. And really the percentage, I couldn't give you an exact figure, but there are so few women, or especially at this point, so few women, you know, competing in the sport. And yeah, there was even fewer getting even to the level of British F3 or Formula 3, Formula 2. And ultimately, there was never going to be anyone that was going to get to Formula 1 because the talent pool was so small. So W Series came about to kind of bridge that gap and get more girls the opportunity to be competing at a high level in F3-like machinery. So it was the first all-female single-seater series um, that came about. And... The big thing about it was that it was free to enter and there was prize money. So effectively, it professionalized uh, women's motorsport overnight. And where that's significant is, I guess, people would be like, okay, well, if women can race against men, why did they make their own series? But they needed that to then give us the opportunity to be competing at that kind of level um, to then now go on to, to different things. So 2019 was the first season of it. It's, like I said, completely unheard of to have you know, the support and backing uh, of a series or any sort of championship to fully fund a driver and to give us, yeah, you know, professional support to then, yeah, progress in the sport. Well, spoiler alert, and people heard this on the intro, but you won it in the first year. What did that mean to you? Yeah, it was huge. It was um, bigger than I thought it was going to be. Um, yeah. Because it's one of those things, and oh, I don't know, I, you go into it and you just want to you wanna win and you expect to win. That's kind of, I guess, just how you feel. But then when you do win, it's actually, like, oh, wait, actually, that's quite, that's bigger than I thought, <laughs> thought that was going to be. And it was quite a short season. We only had six races. And I went in and I was the one with the most recent experience in sort of those kind of cars because I'd raced in, in F3 um, the year before in British F3. So... I felt confident going into it, but yeah, it was the, well, yeah, I guess, especially in the UK, how well it was received um, and, you know, the support that I then felt from, from people within the sport and without, um, outside of the sport was so, so great that it was, yeah, surprising how, how big it felt to me. Yeah, that's really cool. So that was 2019, 2020 comes around, obviously COVID hits. What did your 2020 look like? I actually still raced in 2020. I did plan to return to W Series, but with COVID, the season had to get postponed or put back to, to 2021. So I had to think of some new plans. Um, and I was fortunate enough after 2019 and having, um, you know, the kind of exposure that W Series gave me, I was able to get a sponsor to support me uh, to race over in Europe in a different championship. And it was an OK year. I didn't have the best year and it's difficult to kind of, yeah, make that season work with with COVID and everything it was last minute and um yeah it was a learning year but fortunately with 2021 uh with W Series coming back I had the opportunity to to go back and race the W Series again which you win again right yeah yeah <laughs> but it was yeah. cool because in 2021 if we supported in 2020 or 2019, we supported, um, you know, a race called the German Touring Car Championships at DTM in, in Europe. And so whenever they race, we would go on the same weekends as them and we'll race at the same tracks and be their undercard race. Like you would have in say boxing, you have your, the people that fight before. Yeah. Um, so this year in 2021, uh, W Series managed to get onto the Formula One package. So oh. we would go around and support Formula One and, that felt like a, a big step up and it was really cool to have that. And we mainly raced in Europe, but we managed to come over to, to Texas for the last race, which also felt, yeah, definitely like a massive step up. Was that your first time to Texas? It was, yeah. yeah I've been <laughs> to most places in the States, but um, yeah, never Texas. And I loved it. I had a great time and fortunately, obviously made better by the fact we won, but definitely uh, a, a great weekend and one to, one to remember. For sure. So is F1 your dream goal? Like, is that where you want to get to? 
that's the ultimate goal um yeah for me it's it's the pinnacle of the sport it's something that I feel we're capable of achieving and yeah I definitely want that to be to be my end end goal amazing I can't wait to watch you do it in the future I've taken a lot of your time it's late you're in the UK so we're gonna hit our repeat questions uh before I let you go so the first one is if I wasn't racing I would be um easy and a sports person if I was good enough in another sport a sports person so I'm gonna say a hockey player all right. I love it. Okay. How do you take your coffee? Oh, okay. Oh, this isn't a quick answer. In the <laughs> okay. UK and in Europe, a flat white. In America, yep. just a black coffee. Um, okay. So I drink, I when I go out to coffee, and even at home, I make cortados. The, they're basically oh, like nice. a little bit less than a flat white. Very similar. Yeah, a little cortado. That's, yeah, like, a, yeah. yeah, piccolo is what we call yes. it. Yes. Yes, exactly. Love that. Can I just say, by the way, Amer- you guys don't really get coffee, though. That's my only issue with America. I disagree. Yeah. You think so. Do you? But I just feel like, why do the, the biggest coffees in the world? I'm amazed you said you like a Cortado because you go to Starbucks and it's like a <laughs> gallon of coffee. But that's, but so I guess if you're thinking American coffee, you're thinking Starbucks. But yeah. that is not, I mean, if I have to drink a Starbucks, I will. I don't mind. I don't mind. I'll get a tall black coffee at Starbucks. I'm not getting anything else. But if you go to the right places, you can get some pretty amazing coffee. Okay. In America. I'll ask you in future. Yeah. If you than... next time you're in the States, wherever you are, hit me up and I'll let you know where to get a good Cortado. Amazing. Done. That's okay, all cool. I needed to hear. <laughs> Perfect. All right. Who's been the one person in your life that's kept you motivated? Oh, um, my parents. It's a bit of a cliche answer, but they... I don't think so. I like that answer. Yeah, um, they're just... Well, it's not one person either, but my parents, yeah, they're... It's amazing because with my parents, they're not from a racing background, so I'm so lucky that they're just, yeah, support mechanisms and kind of, yeah, the people that are always there even when it's going right or wrong. For sure. And it sounds like your dad had a big impact on you and just the fact that he took you around to all the races as, as a kid and when it was still just a Sunday, fun day type of thing. Exactly. I, I look back at it. I'm like, Christ, I can't believe you spent your weekends literally dragging my brother and I, who are so ungrateful. All we did was complain and shout at each other. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I guess I'll say them after the, all of that we've put them through. Makes sense. All right. They say work hard, get lucky. How much of your success is predicated on luck? Oh, I say I, I always say quite a lot, to be honest. Um, I think you make your own luck for sure. I agree with that, but there is so much in right timing and I've been so lucky with the timing of my career and I use the word lucky a lot. So I'd say it's 50, 50, but 50, I definitely 50. think there is some, yeah, I definitely think there's luck in everything because like I said, you make your own luck, but when the luck comes, you've got to be there to take the opportunity. And I think you work to take that opportunity, but the luck still has to come at some point. And I've been lucky in my career for sure. I'm into it. I agree. All right. Last question. You've accomplished so much already. Where do you go next and how do you keep pushing? Where do I go next? I mean, keep pushing in anything, even, you know, whatever the case is, I'll keep working hard and making sure I can get to my end goal. Where's next? I'm hoping, I don't know just yet, but I'm hoping, you know, in three years time, I want to be in Formula One. So I want to step up and I want to make that happen. And just to close, to get to Formula One, is it the, you have to advance through F3, F2, F1? Like, is it's a qualification type of um, process? You don't have to. It's the kind of prescribed route, and it's the work route that most people take. I, at some point, will take that route, but I personally don't think you have to take that route. And I want to show that it's not necessarily a case. Like I said, I went to the GT racing. I went so many different ways in my career. So I want to keep doing that. And I'm lucky enough to be able to race in so many cool different things that, yeah, I don't think you have to take the prescribed route, but I think what is next will be something like Formula 3 or Formula 2. What route do you want to take? I want to, so again, I want to race in so many different things in my career. So there's the single seaters as a Formula One route, but there's also, you know, I do some off-road racing as well. I want to race in endurance racing and I want to be able to do it all whilst trying to make that Formula One dream a reality. 
Love it. Amazing. Well, I can't wait to watch you one day race in Formula One and to tell you where to get a good coffee in America. So, Jamie, thank you so much for the time. I appreciate it. I know it's late over there, um, but this has been awesome and I've learned so much. And again, I can't wait to see you shine. No, thank you. Thank you so much. I've really enjoyed it. To succeed, you can't do it alone. You need a team that understands you and your business on a personal level. And WIS takes that approach to help you win. Think less calculators, more conversations. WIS is a proud supporter of this podcast and the JWS community. To discover how WIS is more than just an accounting firm, visit wiscom slash JWS. That's W-I-S-S dot com slash JWS.